Hey, welcome back to hear the teaching this morning. Welcome to Troy Community Church. I'm glad you're with us. If you missed our worship time, then I welcome you here. <clears throat> We're going to continue our study in First and Second Timothy this morning. Uh, I'm going to start at the end of chapter 2, close to the end of chapter 2. I mean, I could go into a commentary mode and go verse by verse, but I just felt like that would be kind of boring. I'd be saying things that are obvious, and I don't see the point. If you've watched my introductions and my overviews, I think it brings us to this point fairly easily. If you haven't seen those introductions, I would encourage you to go and watch them. They'll, they'll help you make better sense of everything I'm going to share from this point forward. So if you haven't watched those, I encourage you to do it. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to address one of the most controversial verses in all of Pauline literature. Uh, if I could get the first slide up. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man. Some of you will notice, I think, that's King James. Um... I don't use the King James translation, and in, in this instance, you're going to find out that it's it's really missed the boat, at least in one very important part of this verse. Maybe it's good I'm giving this teaching from Texas so the women can't throw things at me. <clears throat> but before you get defensive, uh, please allow me to tell a story and to give you the historical backdrop and perspective for this passage so that you'll fully grasp my opinion and really scholarly opinion as to what's happening here. So first, the story. Years ago, Heather and I were visiting our good friends in Tuscaloosa, John and Barbara Gibson, when we lived there. John served with us for many years on our pastoral staff in Chi Alpha. And we would go to their house a lot. Barbara cooked for us. And, we, and John and I had great biblical theological discussions. Well, this particular evening, another one of John's friends, another pastor from another denomination, happened to be there with his wife when we arrived. Well, as usual, we got going into a biblical discussion. It was mainly the three men going at, you know, going at it. Occasionally, Heather would make a comment. The, the other man... The other man's wife, the man that I didn't know, the couple I didn't know, she was sitting in a chair during this, and at one point in the conversation, she spoke up. And as soon as she and she made what I thought was a good comment, as soon as she as soon as she spoke up, the man quickly turned to her and said, "Women shall keep silent." Well, and she took a submissive stance in her chair. Now look, I laughed out loud. I thought he was joking. He quickly wheeled around and started giving me his opinion of what we were talking about and the comment she had just made. And I realized, oh my, he was serious. And I learned after they left later that night, John assured me that yes, that is his doctrine. That's the church they're in. Women cannot speak in church. This is an example, in my opinion, of how Paul's comments in 1 Timothy, in this very unique letter, have been taken out of their historical context and misused, really, for almost entirety of church history, probably. Look, I think we have to read the scriptures properly. Where the text is clear, I'm bound to follow it. Where it's not clear, we have an, we have a, a an obligation to try to search it out, but we also have to realize we all have opinions. And Paul basically says, look, on things that aren't clear, on things that aren't essential, keep your opinion to yourself. Romans chapter 14. We're not going to read it, but I urge you. That whole chapter speaks to this issue. Paul's talking about Jewish food laws, Gentiles eating meat offered to idols, which the Jews abhorred. And Paul basically says, look, these are not essentials. The kingdom of God is not about meat and drink. Whatever you have, whatever opinion you have, keep it to yourself. Keep it between yourself and God. Don't judge your other brother. <clears throat> Paul
Paul's dealing with Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians and how we can live together in the spirit of unity. This text brings up a few principles of how we need to read the New Testament properly. Paul makes very clear statements about women here. So we can't just dismiss them. But the key question is, does he intend for these statements to be universally applied? So the first principle of biblical interpretation is easy. How many times does the New Testament speak clearly about a particular doctrinal position? Once, twice, or even three times is not enough to deem a teaching an essential universal doctrine. Unless the three texts are quite clear, emphatically clear, and there's nothing else in the biblical structure in the New Testament texts that would contradict what you're reading or would seem to contradict what you're reading. There are only two places in the New Testament where women are commanded to be silent in church. This one in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We're not going to read that text. <clears throat> but there is, but the manuscript evidence for the verses in 1 Corinthians 14 are highly problematic. We studied 1 Corinthians, I don't know, a year and a half ago. And I gave a fairly extensive presentation to show how the Greek manuscript evidence is pretty clear that Paul probably, highly likely, did not write those verses. They were added in later on by probably a Catholic monk copyist. And the manuscript tradition, and look, almost all scholars are 100% on this. The manuscript tradition is clear. But even if you count the 1 Corinthians 14 text, that's only two clear times where Paul says women shall keep silent. So our first principle is, it needs to appear more than twice before it's an essential doctrine. The second principle is, is there evidence that the topic at hand or the, 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 the commandment at hand, is there evidence that seems to go against that principle in the other parts of the New Testament? So the question is, does Paul intend for women to be silent all the time? Is that a universal Let me quickly present the evidence for why I do not believe Paul can mean this as a universal. Number one, Paul describes the gospel in the most egalitarian terms, equal terms, that everybody in Christ is, stands equal to one another. There is no distinction. We're going to read that if I can get the slide. Galatians 3.28. For there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ. Look, this is revolutionary in the Greco-Roman world and in the Jewish world. In the Jewish world, a Gentile is a dog. Paul is saying in the church, a Jew and a Gentile are one and the same. Nobody's better than anybody else. You can be a slave, you can be a pauper, and stand next to a wealthy landowner who has slaves, and God will meet you just like he meets the, the wealthy guy. You can be an uneducated woman and be standing next to the highest degreed man, and God will deal with you just like he does that man. He will, his grace is sufficient just like it is for that man, and he will speak to you or through you just like the man that's educated revolutionary, but Paul makes that clear statement in Galatians. And he repeats this throughout his writings in various ways. Number two, in his descriptions of marriage in 1 Corinthians 7, again, I'm not going to read these texts, but you can look them up. I urge you to look them up. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul talks clearly about the husband and wife and how they're to treat one another equally with respect. He says the wife does not have authority over her own body. The husband does. Now that's normal in the ancient world. A man in the ancient world, Jewish, Gentile, it didn't matter. A man could almost treat his wife as a, uh, 
a piece of, of realty or property. He owned that woman, especially her body. He could do whatever he wanted. And Paul's talking about intimacy and marriage. And that is the ancient view. There is no such thing as marital rape in the ancient world. But Paul says that, and then he turns around and says the exact same thing to the man. Your body, as the husband, doesn't belong to you. It belongs to your wife. That is, again, revolutionary. And again, it's a piece of evidence that shows Paul doesn't consider there to be some uh, equality gap between men and women or husband and wife, by the way. The third piece of evidence is in 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul clearly makes room during worship for women to speak using spiritual gifts, prophesying, and praying. Now, those are difficult verses if you look them up, but it's still clear. Paul's speaking about women uttering prayers and prophesying in the middle of the, in the, in front of the whole church, which would include the men. He could have easily said the woman can only teach other women and children. You can't find that in the New Testament, by the way. The last piece of evidence that Paul cannot be saying what seems to be obvious in the verses we're studying is that Paul refers to women that he respects numerous times in his letters. He names them, and he names them as leaders in the church. Look at Romans 16. You should read Romans 16 if you want to see the evidence here. He names Phoebe as a deacon. Several other women are named and given and made comments about as leaders in the church. He names Junia as an apostle, a woman as an apostle. Paul talks about Priscilla and Aquila. I think it's four times he mentions them in, in all of his letters. He always names, oh no, no, he named three of the four times he names Priscilla first. Interestingly, he doesn't call her Priscilla, which is like the feminine, you know, soft, gentle way of referring to a woman. He calls her Prisca, which is a, a term of respect that he's using as her name. And he names her before he names her husband Aquila. That goes against all ancient culture. You're supposed to name the man first and then his wife. Three out of four times, Paul says Prisca and Aquila. All of this, and I'm going to get back to Priscilla and Aquila in a minute, but all of this is clear textual evidence that what Paul says about women not being able to teach men cannot be a universal. And you'll see more of that in just a minute. But it leaves us with the idea Two things. He's, he cannot mean that women should stay silent, and he cannot mean that women cannot teach men. <clears throat> and that leaves us with one other option. <clears throat> that Paul is speaking directly to a specific problem with some women in Ephesus. And that's how you need to read First and Second Timothy and Titus, by the way. As we study through this letter, it will become more clear that that's the only way to read it in light of all of Paul's other writings. Let's pray. Then we're going to read these verses. and We're going to try to figure out not only is clearly what Paul is saying, but what does it say to us now in 2020? Let's pray. Lord, we ask you for clarity. We ask you to speak. Use your scripture. Open our eyes to see your truths. Open our hearts to respond to you, God. I believe you want to say some things to us. Let's start with 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. I want the women, if I could get that slide, I want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold, pearls, or expensive clothing. This is a basic admonition that's quite common in the ancient world. Greek philosophers said things very much like this. 
the Jews said things very much like this. We have a statement in First in First Peter chapter three that is very close to this. So Paul gives a fairly straightforward admonition to the women, and none of the women would have balked at that. But see, Paul says some similar things in 1 Corinthians on a slightly different angle that help us to understand what's going on here. The basic intention, in my opinion, and scholars would argue, the basic intention seems to be, don't come to church to show off your wealth. His problem isn't with braided hair. It's with braided hair that includes pearls and gold. Because if you're a wealthy woman and you come in dressed all immaculately with real expensive clothing on, and there's someone near you who's poor, who can't afford gold or pearls, what are you saying to them? It comes across very arrogantly. Paul doesn't like it. It goes against the egalit. It goes against the view that we're all equal at the foot of the cross. I've heard many of you say that part of what you like about Troy Community Church, and this is really the church movement we're in now, and I'm thankful for it. But I've heard several of you say you like the casual dress. You don't like the idea of having to get dressed up. I agree completely. I think that's Pauline, actually. We, many of us were taught growing up, I know I was, that you dress up to go to church. You wear your Sunday best. Over the centuries, I'm sure that less fortunate people have been too embarrassed to come to church in shabby clothing. And I know as a young man, I saw it. People who came in, if they weren't dressed the way everybody thought they should be, like in my you know, teenage years, if you wore blue jeans, people would look bad at you. They would look down on you. And I've heard stories of that from others. Paul would be appalled at that. This text right here is saying, don't do that. And he says it in 1 Corinthians. And that's one thing that we need to draw from this. Now, why is that so important, though, in understanding women shall keep silent and not teach a man? I'm getting there. It's a good question, though. <clears throat> it's because in the ancient world, wealthy women had expectations on them. I've talked about this before. In the ancient world, wealthy women, most of the time they were widows, were expected to take care of traveling prophets, traveling philosophers. They were expected, and so in the church, they were expected to take care of men who were doing ministry. Um, they were expected, even if they weren't a Christian, to do things for the community, to build a bathhouse or to help build a gymnasium or take care of the poor. That's what you expected of a, of a wealthy widow. So the fact that he's speaking to women about not coming with gold for gold, in your hair. Think about that. I mean, that's pretty odd to me. I mean, admittedly, a lot of us wear gold rings. But, you know, bling. He's talking about bling. Anyway, it appears to be similar to what's happening in Corinth. And it appears that the false teachers are using the wealthy women. The wealthy women are highly likely to be taking them into their big, spacious homes, feeding them, probably have a couple servants waiting on them hand and foot. And that's probably the backdrop. And Paul's not happy with this. And you'll see this recurring. If you Once you hear me say this, now if you read 1 Timothy, you go, oh, that makes better sense. Let's pick up the text where we left off. Next slide. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Now, this is the same verse we started out with, only this isn't King James. This is out of the NIV, but it more adequately translates a key word here, and I'm going to get to it in just a second. While this little text is probably offensive to a lot of women, it would be quite common in the ancient world. They didn't think anything of that. This is pretty normal in the ancient world. And it's a clear statement from Paul. So we've got to figure it out. The first thing to notice is where it says in the King James, keep silent or silence. It's a bad translation. It's hesekia. 
hesekio in the verb. I mean, it means quiet, not silent. So the first statement, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission, carries the, it doesn't carry the idea of what she says and how she speaks. It carries the idea of a, of a quiet, gentle spirit and attitude because it's a learning spirit. Women, it doesn't say a woman should be quiet in church. It says a woman should learn. In quietness. It's talking about an attitude, and it apply, I think it applies to all of us. If you're learning, it's because you don't know something. The best way to learn something is to quietly listen and pay attention and, and not be abrupt and abrasive towards whoever is trying to teach you. Secondly, again, Paul, we're, we're covering these verses and why I do not think they mean a woman has to be silent in church and cannot teach a man. In the book of Acts chapter 18, Luke introduces Apollos. He introduces him as a highly educated man from Alexandria, Egypt, trained in philosophy, and he knows the scriptures, and he passionately speaks in the synagogue refuting the Jews that Jesus is the risen Messiah. <clears throat> And then, at, at, at the beginning of the chapter, Luke introduced Aquila and Priscilla. And that's how he introduced them, man and wife. And then after he introduces Apollos, he says that Apollos was great, except for he didn't completely understand the message of Jesus. And then Luke says, Priscilla and Aquila. He, tr he changes the way he introduces the couple. He introduced them man first. Now he says... After they heard Apollos, the man, I mean the woman and her husband approached Apollos. Priscilla and Aquila approach Apollos and invite him to their home where they teach him. It appears that Priscilla is the lead voice in this instance. It doesn't mean that Aquila was a wimp. It just means Priscilla probably had a more dynamic personality or... Maybe she had been a Christian longer than her husband. Or maybe she was more spiritually gifted than her husband. We don't know. We're never told. But from Luke's introduction to Apollos and Priscilla and Aquila, by Paul's words, it appears quite clear that Priscilla has a measure of authority or something and that she teaches Apollos here. For me, this leaves me with one clear option. Paul is dealing with a very specific situation. He's telling the women who appear to be widows and appear to not be, they appear to be bold and outspoken and other things that we're going to get into. But he's telling Timothy to tell these women to calm down. Be more quiet. He's not telling them to be silent, but be more quiet. And learn with some humility from the leadership of the church, and of course that would be Timothy, is the primary leader of the church. Someone might ask, well, how do you know they're widows? Well, that's a good question. Nine times in this letter, Paul speaks of widows. Chapter five, almost the entire chapter is about widows. And that is, he doesn't do that anywhere else. In no other letter of Paul does he deal with widows like he does in 1 Timothy. He says that the the church is to care for the widows, financially take care of them, but they have to be over 60. And they can't have family. They can't have children because Paul expects the children to take care of them. So they aren't a burden on the church. Well, that immediately makes, makes me and the other scholars believe that the women he's having trouble with are younger widows. And he, told, he goes on. We're going we're gonna to read it in a minute. He makes very direct statements about younger widows. That's what we're going to read right now. If I can get the next slide. The younger widows are to get married, have children, and not give opponents of the faith any occasion for slander. Some of these younger women, or I'm sorry, some of these younger widows have already turned away to follow Satan. It's a very strong statement. 
Following Satan, following Satan is not something that Paul would normally talk about if it's just, you know, sexual sins, even though in 1 Corinthians he hands someone over to Satan, but that's different. It is something that would be said about someone teaching false doctrine or leaving the church because of false teaching. If you remember in 1 John, John talks about the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist. Who's he talking about? The very people in the church telling people that Jesus actually didn't come in the flesh. Now we're going to go further into the text about women as we move through this letter, but right now I want to get really clear about what this says to us. Okay? This is what I think we need to gain from this in 2020. If you're a woman, you have a place in the church. And we need you. The church needs you. If you're spiritually gifted, we need you. If you're a woman and spiritually gifted, actually anybody, we need you. And giftedness is a huge range of stuff. We have women speaking in almost every single service that we have. They're either teaching, or they're leading worship, or they're prophesying, or they're praying out loud, or they're sharing out loud. In almost every service we do, women speak up. And that's intentional. I have believed that women need to be, I believe women have equal opportunity to serve pretty much since I've been a young man. I saw this clearly to me anyway. So that's the first thing. If you're a woman, we need you. Now, if you're a woman with an aggressive personality, you have a greater burden on you to walk in humility and gentleness. Is that fair? No, it's not fair. Life's not fair. Women with an aggressive personality have a burden on them to present themselves without being harsh and without having a submissive attitude. Why do I say that? I've had conversations with women over my years in ministry. I've personally trained several women for pastoral ministry. Almost all of them with aggressive personalities. And when I've said what I just said here to them, some of them have balked. When I told them the burden was on them, and they said, yeah, well, if a man does it, he, he's considered strong. A man can get away with it. That's not true. It's not true. You ask any man. If a man does that, the same thing, he's considered by other men to be a jerk. Balaam's donkey. I could use a harsher term, but you get the picture. And if a man is a jerk like that, is harsh, and comes across, you know, like they know it all, it's not uncommon for another alpha man to get in his face and challenge him physically. Oh, Al, that's not Christ-like. I, I agree. No, I'm not saying that it's right. But that's a dynamic between men that men can't have with a woman. Most men have trouble with aggressive women because if she's a jerk to you, what are you going to do? You, you can't punch her. So most, most men will just avoid you. Most men will avoid the aggressive man who is a jerk, actually. The man in my opening story who spoke to his wife, he should have never done that. You just, you never speak to your wife like that in front of other people. I mean, we should never speak to each other like that, period. But, you know, and we all mess up. But a man should never talk to his wife like that in front of other people. And a woman should never, ever do it towards her husband. Well, Al, why do you put such emphasis on a woman not doing it? Well, there's, there's a reason. If another man sees a woman treat her man like that, other men lose respect for that guy. So if you're an aggressive kind of woman and you, wanna, and you want other men to think poorly of your man, then treat him like that. 
because that's the immediate feeling that men get. They don't respect a man who lets a woman run over him like that. So, again, the burden is on the aggressive woman. Look, none of us should be rude. None of us should be harsh. We all mess up. We all mess up. But when we mess up, we need to humble ourselves. We need to not make excuses. We need to not point out the other person's flaw. To use that as a reason, well, I wouldn't have done it if you hadn't. You have to take responsibility for your actions and your attitude. And submission is not 100% agreement. You can be submissive in spirit and still question and challenge your leader with a good attitude. I can tell you the way to fall out of favor with me is to get an attitude with me and then never humble yourself. That's hard for me to overcome sometimes. Several of you have told me that I'm too hard on myself. Well, the burden is on me. I have an aggressive personality. I have a personality that le lends itself to arrogance. The burden is on me to show humility, to not be that way. I might be hard on myself, but God has shown me over the years I have to humble myself in front of other people in various ways. It's just the burden is on me to do that. Is that fair? Well, maybe not. I can take people getting angry with me. I can take someone yelling at me and having a bad attitude as long as I see repentance and humility. And then grace is always going to be the answer. The key to this passage, I think, is verse 11. Learn with a quiet and submissive attitude. And that's the message for aggressive women, but that's the message for me. That's the message for all of us. When someone is teaching you something that, that you don't know, this happened to me the other day with my little brother needing help on a computer programming issue. And he kept interrupting me, asking me, or I kept interrupting him, sorry, asking him questions, and he he pretty much said, Alan, be quiet and let me finish. Well, I wasn't being quiet and I wasn't having a, you know, he was helping me and I was, I was getting frustrated. So the message is clear. We are all learners. We all need to have a quietness about us, a calmness and submissive spirit when we are following and being taught. And that's what Timothy's dealing with in Ephesus. And the women that he's dealing with need to hear this. Especially they need to not follow false teachers. And that's, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story, which we'll get to. Let's all keep praying that this COVID virus ends quickly so we can all be back to work and be together in our church service. Thank you, God, for speaking. Help us. Help us, God. We need help. We all need help. We all need help to hear you and to live for you. Be with every single person through this difficult time. Provide for those who are in need, Jesus. Bring it to an end, I pray. At least so that our little church can gather together again. To worship you in Jesus name. Amen. All right. I think I'll see you next week, uh, remotely. And that'll, that I'm hoping and praying that's our last time to meet remotely. So take care. You're always welcome to contact me, email me, call me, text me, whatever. Take care. God bless.